Arsenal were beaten by Nottingham Forest. And as far as the table is concerned, well, Arsenal then will finish in second place. Newcastle and Manchester United just one point away from their remaining games from finishing in the Champions League places. Then it's Liverpool in fifth. Brighton will definitely be playing European football for the first time in their history next season. And they're probably going to finish in sixth. It'll take a massive goal swing for them to finish out of there. And Aston Villa and Tottenham still chasing down European football. A couple of bits and pieces still to be decided at the top of the table. We'll have lots more uh, chat about that in the final two Kelly and Wrighties of the season. With us for this one, Karen Carney and Miguel Delaney. And not here in person, but here in spirit, Wrighty with the Premier League trophy. I have a replica of the trophy uh, in the studio just to finish the show with. <laughs> <laughs> Delivered, <laughs> delivered by one member of the family for the other. <laughs> it's not funny. Uh, it's not funny. Sure. Yeah, how are you doing? They were, of course, the two uh, <laughs> Premier League winners, uh, father and son combination, writing with, with Sean Mike Phillips there. Great weekend for, for Manchester yeah. City, but sealed before they even kicked a ball. Yeah, that was the only thing about yesterday. We were going to the stadium yesterday and thinking, oh, if Arsenal had a bit for us today before, it would have been extra special, you know, because there's a bit more to it. Be more age on the game, but at the same time, you know, you, you Man City players take it when they can, and, and of course, I think at one stage of the season, the rate points to drift, weren't they, of Arsenal? So there was pressure at a stage, but I think they won 12 Premier League games on the bounce now. They've shown why they're champions again, and, and it was a special atmosphere after the game with getting the trophy and all. And you can see the players are talking John Stones and a few of the last John Stones' five Premier League titles. I spoke to Phil Foden off the camera, five Premier League titles, he's 22 years of age. You got we mentioned the treble at the top of the show. How many trophies these guys going to win? But it's it's uh, yeah they they I think they had a few uh, celebratory drinks last night, should we say, Kelly? <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine that now is the time to do yeah, it. There's so. just enough time to recover before the FA Cup yeah. final, the Champions League final for those City players. But look, as Shay was saying, it's just been relentless between what whenever it was 12 games ago, from from being beaten by Tottenham to this run that could end up as a record equaling 14 straight wins to end the season. It's unbelievable, and like. I don't know what the, what the shift was. Do you know what what really pushed them into like sip gear? Really and goes right. We're going to turn the heat up now. And I don't know what it was because they just stabbed it like a train. Just and no one could stop them. And it's just been remarkable. And to do it season after season, it's five out of six now. is just unbelievable. Um, and the, I thought they found the formula, but I thought maybe with the World Cup break, it might have given teams another opportunity where that formula might have been broken because they usually start the season off quite slow and then they get stronger, stronger, stronger. But I thought maybe this might be the season. I think we're all thinking maybe it's Arsenal's time. But just to turn the heat up, and you mentioned the run there, Shay, it was just incredible. And they haven't done it easy. You know, teams are beating them along the way and you're thinking, OK. But uh, I don't know. It's just Pep Guardiola, isn't it? We could talk about it. So many, so many things with City, but for me, it's about if they didn't have him, it wouldn't be City. Yeah, and, and five of the last six Premier League trophies have been won by, by Manchester City. And as the guys have been saying, we've seen them do it in different ways. What we haven't seen is them chase in quite the way that they have had to chase this, this Arsenal side. Yeah, that's it. I mean, in, with, it's the closest probably 2019 with Liverpool. Liverpool had a lead for some time. I think it was, it was seven points at that January game when they beat them 2-1, the... the ball cleared off the line from uh, John Stones. Um, but never like this. I mean, this was a bit more like, I suppose, the, their first title, our first Premier League title in 2012 where they hauled in Manchester United. And United actually had a similar, not quite the um, the way our, what happened to Arsenal, but there was those three games. Then they on. wobbled a bit, gave yeah. it back to Manchester yeah. United and then and then beat them in the in the running. Th that's exactly it. And that's what's, that's what's so different about this city in that it's just been, and I suppose the evolution they've been on since 2012, where at the moment they're unstoppable. I mean, it's not just about all the wins. In, in that run, in that final 14 games, they've only been behind for 10 minutes. They've been, I think the stat is, they've been 2 nil up or two goals clear 50 times more than they've been losing, which is, um, so the regular yeah. state is winning games. And it, it does feel like City winning at the moment is, is an inevitability, and that's why people are talking about yeah. the treble. We'll talk about that a bit, a bit later on, after we've reflected on, on this season. And you picked out some of the, the players there. I mean, you look at that squad... And they are a yeah. quite, they're not, not quite as young as, as Arsenal, but it is a very youthful squad with more titles in them. Yeah, well, Haaland joined last year, of course, and we'll talk about the no number nine or a false number nine. And 
We mentioned about maybe they brought the inverted fullbacks or John Stones has played that role, Karen, you mentioned before, uh, you know, how well he's done that. And Pep always seems to revolve his systems or his team or his squad. Because we talk about the great Alex Ferguson over the years. He kept, revol you know, the team kept changing, the squad kept changing, but they kept winning titles, didn't they? Mm. And Karen's right, it's Pep Guardiola. It's that Pep Guardiola effect. As if, like, as you're right, there's a slow start to the season. Then the World Cup, then it was like, right, jokes are over now. Yeah. <laughs> we need to put the foot to the throttle here. We need to get the title win. We need to, you know, Arsenal were, were looking brilliant at that stage. Let's not get away. And there's even Ian Wright was talking about it in the, in the studio, saying that this is our year. And, 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 and to be fair, I think from a Man City point of view, they were very worried. Because there's only certain a gap you can give, and and, and they want to be three games to go. We would never have thought that when Arsenal were eight points clear. So you have to give them great credit for that, the players and the staff. But then you maybe look at the Arsenal side of things. Did, I wouldn't say the word bottled. Did they crumble? Did they, you know, they've got a young, exper inexperienced team have not been here before. Have they? Has the pressure been too much? Has it got to them? Because you know, looking over your shoulder, there's this juggernaut of a, of a football club and a team and a squad and a manager, they're coming chasing you hard and it's a difficult one to shake off, I think, perhaps. Yeah, and also they knew that in that second group of fixtures, there was the postponed Manchester City yeah. fixture, so they had to play City twice, even with that eight-point advantage. So there were always six points that could be could be clawed back by, by Manchester City at, at that stage. But in terms of the, those players coming to form at exactly the right time, mm. that's what's been <clears throat> crucial to them having this, this run into the end of the season. You mentioned Haaland. And obviously there were questions at the, at the start of the season, it seems a long time ago now, <laughs> about whether or not it would take anything away from Manchester City. Haaland certainly added plenty of, of his own. But do you think that we've seen at the end of the season, at the latter stages of the season, that City have managed to keep everything they had last season and add Haaland to it, rather than that maybe a period of adjustment at the beginning? I think, though, Pep did come out in the press at one point and said, I needed more from you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think he came out and was like, I need him to press more, I need him to come to feet more. It was a bit like, whoa, look at the stats that he's, he's, mm. he's delivering, but he wants more from him. And I do think you're right there, Kelly. I think he's, they adapted him right at the peak at the right time. But I don't think it was plain sailing. Even though he was getting the goals, we were still talking around. Mm. It doesn't feel right. He's making runs. They're not finding him. It's still not, like, clicking. But I think he started to click when Stones went and played as a cent centre-back and then started going into centre midfield. And they started to then kind of also pick his best team at times. I think he was chopping and changing. I don't know whatever that reason is. Um, but I, part of me also kind of thinks, you, you mentioned like titles there. And I think why I mentioned about Pep, it's not easy winning titles. Like winning one is like a challenge. But I think the hardest thing is winning back-to-back titles because there's so much pressure on you. And I think getting there, it's fun, it's exciting. But to do it, and that's why I'll go back to Pep. He's like, how do you motivate your players to do it season after season? We've seen lots of clips of them doing their inspirational talks. How, how do you do it? Is it bringing a centre forward and challenge your team? Is it actually dropping or challenging Kyle Walker? You can't play that position. Or is it Stones? I'm going to educate you to play a position that you don't know, that you've never played before. And is it I'm going to scare Arteta saying, you might try what I've done previously because I've effectively coached you, but I'm going to take you to another level. It probably is all of that, but you're right, Kelly. He's just doing it throughout the season to then go, at the end of the World Cup, we're not messing around now. Like, we've tried and tested, but we've got to go to another gear now. I think that is one of the stories that's come out. Not so much after the World Cup, but more so after the Forest game, which is the last time they dropped points. I mean, the story is the squad got together under Pep and basically said, right, enough is enough. Uh, they discussed the whole situation and was going on and basically said, we're, we're going to get in gear. And that was also a follow-on just after the World Cup. I mean... For me, one of the I suppose quotes of the season when Guardiola said, uh, "We don't want to be the happy flowers team," because they thought they were, basically that they were too they're too content in what they'd won. Mm. Uh, he obviously got rid of Cancelo in January, and things kind of suddenly fell into shape in a few ways. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk on all these points about Pep Guardiola and, and his specific influence a little bit a little bit later on. But and we will we'll come sorry, back. Sorry, Kelly, to, I got well no, excited. No, but I, no, yeah. but I, I take your point that right, it doesn't sorry. it doesn't happen without Guardiola. No. This sort of relentless kind of winning mentality that that Manchester City have doesn't happen without him. But and we'll, we'll focus on that. But just to to sort of concentrate on some of the the players for a while and the performances that they've put in over mm -hmm. the season. Obviously, it's it's always De Bruyne, but again not played in, in every single game this season. He's been used mm -hmm. in a way that's allowed him to peak at the right time as well. Yeah, and I think he's followed with 
Pepper a couple of times as well over the course of the season. But they've talked about that tension between yeah. about how he, that De Bruyne will shout at, at Guardiola on the training ground. I think Kevin, to be fair, he plays on the edge a bit as well. I was at the Madrid game during the week when he had his fat back. I was just right in front of where I was sitting and and they both had a bit of a row together, you know, but I think that's... Kevin's that sort of individual. Sometimes he needs a rocket to, to get the best out of him, but you, like, you cannot talk about Man City and not talk about Kevin De Bruyne. He's been absolutely special. And we talk about the link-up play with, with Haaland being assigned as well, Jack Grealish this year. I mean, there's so many positive, positive, you know, Phil Foden can get in the team, for example. Mm. Maris can get in the team. Bernardo Silva, I thought, you know, was brilliant the other day as well. It's just, it's just the quality throughout the team. We talk about John Stones, and rightly so. He's an unsung hero. We talk about maybe Aki, not so much, because there's so many of these superstars. But Aki this year has been brilliant at the back. Ederson, again, has been pretty solid. I don't know. There's, there's a very few weaknesses. And I think if you're going to be Premier League winners, that's, that's what you need, very few weaknesses. But... As Karen says, it's the psychology of it all. So they win the league now, and even we're talking about the treble maybe a bit later, but they've got two massive trophies still they play for. Mm. So how does Pep get the psychology of the team? Right, lads, all right, let's enjoy the moment for the... Maybe we had a few drinks last night, but come back down to earth today. We've got Brighton on Wednesday, we've got you know Brentford next weekend, but we've got Man United the week after in the FA Cup final, and we've got Inter Milan in the Champions League final. So how do you get the psychology right? We have to come back down to earth, start from scratch nearly again, and try and be this historic season and we, we, they think they can be. Shay, you know, and De Bruyne, if he wasn't the best player in the Premier League, do you reckon he'd get away with saying that to Pep? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> if it was Cancelo, he might have got hooked up, I think. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, we sit, did. Sit, I know, <laughs> sit, sit next yeah. to me here. Well, yeah. That, but he is a special talent. But again, because uh, it's about it's about man management then. You know what I mean? You have to get the best out of these players and some people need an arm around their shoulder and maybe Kevin De Bruyne to get the best of them maybe needs a rocket, but Kevin's at boiling point sometimes mm -hmm. and he has a, he has a goal back. The other player who you just mentioned there was, was Jack Grealish and the performances that he's put in this season. When it felt last season as though he was struggling to adapt to life at Manchester, there were some good performances in there, but we never saw him quite hit the heights that he, he's hit this season. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's a bit. I mean, I suppose when you're playing under a manager like Guardiola, that's uh, when like when you speak to people who played under him, that's one of the things they stress more than anything. Almost, it's not just about playing your game; it's actually almost learning the game again because he, the way he looks at it. And I think with Grealish, it was almost taken... I mean, I suppose people would have loved Grealish for his individual style, but this is... A, I mean, the one thing about Guardiola above anything else is the most kind of... the deepest collective in football. And actually, that, I mean, we'll come on to it, I suppose. That was one of the issues, if you can call it that, with Haaland at the start. But initially with Grealish, it feels like... I remember being told that one of the things Pep kept saying to him was, your job is to draw defenders and create space. And obviously now he's learned that. And once he's, once he's perfected that then it can kind of maybe bring out more of the, the real Grealish that we've seen. There was, sorry, there was a good clip last week at the Real Madrid game, actually, and, and Real Madrid's second half were getting really into the game, and they were starting to add the pressure, and the ball would, got released once to Jack Grealish, and Jack actually put his foot on it and just just sort of calmed the game down because they were losing the possession, they were, they were creating some chances, and then he kept it simple. And Pep probably gave a bigger clap for that than any of the goals they scored because Jack's sort of grown into the position, grown into what he wants from what Pep wants from him, you know. And it was like he was like blowing kisses and everything. He was that, he was that happy that, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Jack had that experience and that know-how to go, like, right, this game's getting a wee bit away from us. I mean, let's just calm it down, keep the ball. But, yeah, again, it's, it's the Pep story. You know, it takes a while to sort of get into his side, get, get his coaching, what he wants from the individual players. And we've seen it before from other players, haven't we? Yeah, doing exactly the opposite of probably what he's been told at every other stage yeah, in his true, career yeah. from a kid all the, all the way through. But we talked about Manchester City ending the season strongly on a regular basis. And one of the players that always seems to come up clutch at this stage of the season is Ilkay Gundogan. And you caught up with him after yesterday's game. Okay, you referenced responsibility. How much do you put on your take put on yourself due to every last part of the season you all step up and Carl referenced you to a prime Zidane earlier in the week? <laughs> well, I appreciate that him saying. Um, but, um, you know, as I said before, um, I, I, start, I, I try to stay calm. I mean, I remember last season when I, when I scored the two goals here against Villa on the last day. I haven't played the previous two games, actually, um, in the league and also in the Champions League in the semis against Real Madrid. And I was a bit mad, I was angry, I was frustrated, but I, I tried to, to filter that, you know, and to get uh, that actually into, into performance on the field. And um, I think this is, um, this is the maximum you can do. And then um, I think at one point, um, things will go your way, your way again. It's just about staying patient. And I mean, with the quality that we have, you know, um, there, there are no question marks. I think that um, we're going to be successful. And now we have uh, two more finals to go, you know, and... Um, that's, uh, that's what, we, what we're looking for now. 
I was just going to check these arms if I can lift two more trophies this season. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hey, no, don't worry. I've been, I've been, pen, I've been doing plenty of gym work, so they're ready. He's making sure that he's ready for that one, Ilkay Gundogan. And, of course, with Pep Guardiola's first signing at Manchester City and sort of embodies exactly what, what he wants from that side because while players have come and gone in his reign, Gundogan has been the, the ever-present. And he, he, his pattern of a season, mm -hmm. sort of Manchester City's pattern, sort of follows that. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, I think even Pep said he's a, he's a leader when, when he's... I know he's a captain, but you think he's relatively soft-spoken. That was against Everton, the goal. What, what a special goal that was. I think I likened it to Dennis Bergkamp in his prime. It was yeah. a special goal. But again, I was there 12 months ago when they were 2-0 down to Aston Villa, yeah, and he yeah. came off the bench and scored two massive goals. You talk about the Aguero goal, how, how sort of famous that is in Manchester City's history, but them two goals against Aston Villa, in my opinion, were as famous. And I, I was going to ask him about that, but he actually answered that yesterday, and I was like, oh, I'm struggling. I think it's yeah. harder to ask questions when you're doing yeah. some interviews than anything. <laughs> what I'm going to ask him, I just felt, just check his arms, see if yeah. they're strong enough. Because I think you spend your whole career trying to, ask, trying to find a nice way to answer them, and then you think, God, nobody wants me to now. Two big titles still left, but he, yeah. he said yesterday before, this is his first time as a captain lifting the Premier League title, yeah. you know, so... Um, yeah, he's a, he's a special player, yeah. Were you the last person in the stadium? <laughs> oh, come on. Man. I was watching that. The, no, I was, I was watching that. I was about three years after the game. That's what I was saying. No. Like every, but the players that didn't seem to want to, to leave no, long no. after the final no. whistle had gone, and no, you no, certainly didn't some, want to some leave. Some of the City fans get a bit of stick for being empty. Oh, no, that's, that's, that's not how not I meant it. No, no, no. No, but they were. There was a couple of hours after the game, so they don't know if they're the honour and stuff, and then the players come back over and spoke to us and stuff, you know, but... Yeah, it's just amazing when you say five times title, and I was like looking at his medal, and he goes, "Have you not got one?" I was like, "No, I'm not got one." Gonna <laughs> give me one, give me a spare. As if this was like you can get them on eBay or something. Yeah. It was just like, yeah. Do you want one? You want one? Yeah, yeah. I'll take it. Ilka, yeah, but no, he's a brilliant player, and they talk about obviously his contracts up now in the summer as well. I would definitely tie him down if they can keep him keep him there for another couple of years. Do you think City have a first choice eleven at the moment? I think they probably do. I think when it comes to the finals, I think the next couple of Premier League games, they'll be able to sort of chop and change. And we even seen that yesterday against Chelsea, he chopped and changed a few. But I would say in the both finals, he's got his team, his strongest team in his head already. I don't know what you guys Unless think. Unless he but does I something crazy. that he has done. <laughs> no, he, <laughs> said, he said that. No more no, overthinking. overthinking he's, yeah. always, he's promised that already in the Champions so. League. It, 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 well, it does feel like Haaland actually eliminates that. I mean, that's, I mean again, well, I suppose we'll come on to it and how he's done it. But, I mean, previously... Pep, I mean, one of the things you'd most associate him is, is the ability to kind of change a team and, you know, different approaches for different games. Whereas now it feels like Haaland's in the team and obviously De Bruyne then and everything kind of follows from that. So it maybe kind of just clarifies his thinking as well. Yeah, do you, do you think it feels like there's, a, there's an 11 there that you could... Because at times, you're right, you would have sat down... And, and while we remember the times where Guardiola made changes and it didn't work out, there were plenty of times where he made the changes and it, it worked mm. to City's advantage, but... There were plenty of times you'd look at a team sheet and go, how, mm. how is that quite going to fit together? Whereas now you could probably reel it off for the, the two finals coming up, I as Shay was saying. The, they're that good. They don't need to worry about anybody else, I think. Mm. I think if they just do what they've been doing with the team, I think Shay's right. I think he knows he's 11. If he said tomorrow is the Champions League final, FA Cup final, pick your best team, he could do it. Because I think they're that good. All they got to do is apply themselves and they'll be fine. They start worrying about other things and over tinkering and doing things like that. So you cause your own problems because there's been no evidence along the way. Look at the Real Madrid performance, you know, look at the performances throughout the Premier League. When they've got their main 11, they've, no one stopped them. They're like a train. You can't stop them. And that inner belief and that confidence, which you saw on the pitch yesterday after the game as well, is you just got to enable them to go and do it. And I, I don't think anyone's going to stop them. Um, talking about not stopping anyone, I know I've been holding everybody back about mm. talking at length about Pep Guardiola, but that's what we're going to do next as we focus on the Manchester City manager and the job that he's done in assembling this group of players who have now won their fifth Premier League title in the last six seasons. So, I've got one question for you. How does Pep do it? Leadership, character, clarity, great communicator, friendship, <laughs> probably. And uh, someone had the capacity to, to see what's happening five seconds before anybody else. It was always kind of a dream, you know, to, to call him one day your manager. 
the, the connection with Pep, um, how we both see the game, it's, it's a joy. We speak often about the team, but in, in a lot of sense, he just he gives me a lot of freedom. I, I don't know why. He just I think most of the time, he just let me be me. I've never seen anyone like actually love the game like him. You know, you could obviously see on the touchline sometimes when like how uh, passionate he is. You know, how he wants the best from everyone every single day. He's the most passionate guy I've ever seen for football. Demands so much from us as players and individuals, and won't stop. You know, he says it over and over. It's his, it's his obligation, and there's always that feeling of you can do more or you can be better. It takes that winning something to, to realise right. That's that's the that's the benchmark. Now we've got to recreate that. I think it's changed everybody in football, and whether you like it or not, it's changed the game. Do you think he, he has changed the game? 11 league titles since 2008 and 2009 with Barcelona, Bayern Munich and, and Manchester City. Way ahead of Mas, uh, Mas, Max Allegri there as well. I was going to go for the full Massimiliano. <laughs> but when you, when you look at it, it, it you know, that he has had that incredible success at, at, at league title level. Mm. And there has been a Guardiola effect. I'm not sure whether that's been over his time at Manchester City or if it goes all the way back to his time at Barcelona. Mm -hmm. We just spoke about Gundogan there before the break and then you see hear that little piece there and he's like, it was just actually an honour to, to call him my manager because mm -hmm. that's what he is in, in football, in world football. Players from all around the world want to play for this guy because in my opinion, he's a genius. He, he, he thinks, sleeps, breathes and eats football and, and, and the messages that these players receive on a daily basis, he just, rep repetition, he drills it into them. And everyone knows exactly what he wants from him. And it helps when you've got a brilliant team with brilliant players and individual qualities and stuff as well. But he strikes me as the kind of character who you'd want to play for. As a, as a, as a player, you'd love to play for Pep Gordon. You'd love to be part of his team, how he plays, the way they play, the way they entertain, the way they create chances, the way they score goals, the way they dominate teams, both the ball but also with chances. And they entertain, you know, we talk about maybe the Newcastle back maybe the entertainers. These guys are the modern day entertainers and, and Pep at the helm of that is just so special. I think he's changed it because when I used to watch like the Premier League, I think a lot of managers, not criticising them, would put out a team to, to win a game of football. I think he coaches his players and I think this season's shown that Pep, Arteta, Howe coach their players, bring the best out of them and have outperformed everybody really and certain surpassed some of our expectations. But I think him, like I look at his team and like he makes every player better. He changes his system. He's a he's a coach. Mm -hmm. I don't know about his his man management or player management. But even go back to to when I played, I don't think a coach ever really a manager to and like never really probably made me better or challenge me because you inherit a player and you think right this player will do me a role. This is what I want you to do. But I always look at his teams and I think. Like, look at John Stones, he's never played that position. Mm. He, he can't just say, go and do it. He's got to sit down with him, coach him, educate him, make him do that role. I think he's just the ultimate coach. And it goes from Barcelona with the false nine to Philip Lahn at Bayern Munich to Stones or Haaland or Grealish. He's like, always makes his players better. And I think, I think that's what's changed our game here in the Premier League, that it's not about putting a team out to get results. He coaches them to make them better. And to watch us, even the goalkeeping thing that you mentioned yeah. earlier, Shay, what were you saying mm. about goalkeepers? Yeah, I think since 2016 and the Premier League in general, they've, they've played out with yeah. goalkeepers in general and all the clubs who play a lot more from the back and keep possession yeah. and ball rent retention. But who joined the Premier League in 2016 was Pep Guardiola. He, he's he tried it the whole with Bravo, league, didn't huh? work, and then yeah. Edison was... Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, all our, all our managers, yeah. all our coaches and, everybody and does. everyone yeah. around the world yeah. looks at this as, as, a, as a sort of pinnacle of how to play football. That, that's exactly it. I was about to say, I mean, it's it's not just obviously playing it from the back in terms of your whole team. It's about changing goalkeepers. The fact that now being good with the ball at your feet is now yeah. key, and that all comes from Guardiola. And it's not just the Premier League level. Like, I think it was Rigo Saki that said it. I mean, he was obviously an influence on Pep and someone considered in the same terms that in football history now there's a before Pep and an after Pep yeah. and how it's played. I think that, I mean, because it's, it's not just the Premier League in terms of playing out from the back, you see it like right through the divisions yeah. and even the way kind of like kids are coached now. It all mm. comes, and that, that's 
I suppose, an influence that goes beyond winning trophies. And I think I think that it's an interesting point about the fact that it's just about the intensity of the of the coaching and the the focus on on individual players, but also in terms of style, as you're saying, it's affected goalkeepers. Mm -hmm. And there was a there was a while when everybody wanted yeah. to play like like Barcelona, mm -hmm. but even. Pep Guardiola himself has moved yeah. on from that well, well, style of play. And he, he hated that tiki-taka term yeah, because yeah. he was like, that's not what we do. Yeah, yeah. That's what people who are trying to copy us do and don't do it as well. Yeah, because it was too <laughs> passive, basically. Yeah. yeah, Where it's all about intensity and pressing. And even, let's look across the road from City, the issues that Man United are having there where there's this big debate about the gay, and that all comes because he, he, he's, they don't think he's as good with his feet. Mm -hmm. And that all comes, of course, from... What Guardiola's on the football? Yeah, going back even to Pep there, but that you know, he's talking about five seconds in his head, things happened before. We look at the probably the biggest game of the season was when Arsenal came to the Etihad. It was so close in the title race, wasn't it? And Arteta knows Pep inside out. Mm -hmm. He was there for three years as his assistant, so we knew exactly. And Arsenal pressed him. Hey, what did they do? They skipped That's over the press, hit Haaland, and, and they played out of it. Like he's a step ahead of every manager or coach, it seems, because he knows Arteta as well, Pep, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He thinks he's going to press him. He's just He's just a one step ahead of the rest. Well, I, I mean, we were talking about off air earlier, and you, you brought up when he when he spoke to Kasparov at the Shea. But you do wonder. I mean, can, does anyone think about how football actually the mechanics of it to the level that Guardiola does? And mm. This is this is why people call him a genius, because it, obviously it's some sort of spatial awareness or how it moves. But evidently, he's just able to. He's got this depth of thinking for it. So you're talking about Kasparov, the chess yeah, the yeah, master, yeah, who yeah. is, and that idea of it being, uh, you're trying to anticipate your opponent's next move, and yeah. you have several options when they make whatever it is their move is, is going to be. I think yeah. it's, and I think yesterday was a, a good example. You, you're playing against Chelsea, you've spent so much money, like so much money, and yet can't play out from the back. <laughs> they had no playbook, they yeah. had no, no chess moves, in essence, and you're like, but... City have an answer to everything. Okay, if we get high press, will we skip the link? If we, if you stand off us, we'll play. We'll suck you on. We've got to do what we got to do. We overload in your wide areas. So like, everything, every problem that you throw us, we've got a solution, and we've all, already seen it before. And you're right. He's just so good mm. at that. But I think it was just really interesting against a team that spent, you know, so much money, but just absolutely nowhere near him either. And it's just about you still, even when you spend money, you still need a top quality coach. To, to help you get to the next level. And you need to spend the right money yeah, as yeah. well. You branded, need to bring, branded. you need to have, have mm. good player acquisition and that's something that's been been set up at the club since before yeah. I mean, before Guardiola came this, in. This is the other thing about the, the whole project as well. I mean, it, everything was, even before Guardiola came, they are basically, because they knew he was the best, they were, they were planning for him. So everything was built according to his specifics. And I suppose you can see the, uh, the effect of that now. With everything that he has achieved, with changing the way that, that football is played from his time at Barcelona through to his time now at Manchester City, where there are still those innovations that we're seeing other teams sort of put onto the pitch at various stages. What does he need to do now to be considered in the same bracket as, say, Sir Alex Ferguson? Is, is, he, is he there yet? Uh, well, he can do it the next couple of weeks, Kelly. We're talking about the treble, aren't we, this season? And we're talking about the 1990. Man United it's obviously won the treble in 99, and they, they obviously were a phenomenal team. Um, individually and collectively and, and at the at the helm of that was Sir Alex Ferguson, one of the best managers of all time that, that's ever graced the Premier League, isn't it? Let's be honest. So I think Pep was brought to the football club to win the Champions League. He'll say that the Premier League's the most important thing and that's what he comes every season to get to. But Sheikh Mansour and Caldoun, who was there yesterday, will be like, No, this is this is why we brought you to the Premier League. We brought you to the Premier League to win the Champions League. And if he does that, it's only a couple of weeks away, let's be honest. Man United in the FA Cup final and of course into Milan in the in the Champions League final. If he does that Talks about legacy, Pep Guardiola. He'll have a legacy in this country for a long, long time, and rightly so. He's, he, we, you mentioned the word genius. I think he is. He's a football genius, and um, you know everything he does. It seems touch, turns to gold. Apart from the Chelsea game, which we spoke about the, the final in Porto a few years back, where he, where he tried to over tinker it. But I think we all agree. I think he's got a set eleven now that that'll probably start against Inter Milan, and if they can play to their maximum, then. I think they'll get the job done. Yeah, and now that the title is sewn up, Pep Guardiola is talking about the treble. I've been uh, I've been so demanding this period, and now we have like I had the feeling, okay, we leave the trophy now is well, now thinking go to Brighton is so exhausted, <laughs> you know, because it's I know how difficult they are, and you have to leave. To, the player has to celebrate it, otherwise there's no sense. But at the same time, I don't think we'll arrive with with time to rest mentally the two finals against United and Inter de Milan. But we have to play two more games and, and you have to try to be ready. So I said enjoy, but guys, be careful because still we are there and it will be a pity if you are distracted 
what we have the, this competition ahead of us. He's right. The, the thing that they, they have in their favour now is a, is a gap between mm. that game against Brighton and the FA Cup final, then a gap again to the, the Champions League final. And at the end of, of this season, when they are on that run, that could go either way. Mm. You know, they, they've been in such a role midweek, weekend, midweek, weekend, mm -hmm. and everything's been going perfectly for them. You just wonder if maybe that's the one time... Look, I'm throwing a bit of jeopardy in here to try and make a conversation. <laughs> Don't, do it, Kelly. Don't do it. No, but it feels inevitable that, that City are going to go on and get the treble. But if there was one tiny thing, it could just be that that rhythm maybe being well, being lost. For me personally, obviously they would have celebrated yesterday the title, and they would have celebrated last night. Let's not get away from it. They would have had a few beers last night after the game, and and the euphoria of winning a Premier League title. And we mentioned some of the players five times. The feeling doesn't doesn't change. It's still an, an unbelievable you know feeling that for these players. So the ecstasy of that, and then they have to come in today for warm downs and prepare for Brighton again. I'd be surprised if he goes full strength yeah. against Brighton. I think maybe next week against Brentford, Brentford in the last yeah. game mm -hmm. I've seen. I think you'll probably see more of the final team against against Brentford and maybe make a few changes. I don't know what you guys think, but make a few changes midweek again. It does feel like that, doesn't it? That it'll maybe give them a rest in midweek mm. and then use Brentford as kind of to keep them in, in the right rhythm, as you said, for the final. Because I mean, if, if it's two weeks without your first team playing, yeah, that's almost a, a bit time. too long. Mm. Well, what did you want as a player? I wanted did to party, you? Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I've just spent how many months doing well. I wanted to have a little bit of a party. But um, with that, though, you're right. You can't take away the players celebrating. But equally, when you celebrate and you've got a game, the probability of picking those players... Because you've got to let them have a, have a good time because mm. that's why you play football. But then you don't want to increase the injury rates. So he's got to be really careful, but equally I'd look at it and go, which one suits my game plan? Does Brentford or Brighton replicate Inter or Man United? And I've got yeah. to prepare for that. So actually being a bit tactical about which team plays where and when. Um, so I, I actually thought, I, personally, I was looking at it, I could have gone stronger against Brighton. Okay. Because I think, you mentioned it there, there's, but mm. if he's looking in the eyes of his players and they're tired... Mm, he can't yeah. do that because he can't have broken players. You have to pick your freshest players. So I think he'll have to just go, who's fit, who's fresh, yeah. who can I rely on? And But I think if he had the choice, I think he'd go stronger for Brighton yeah. because I think they'd tactically be more problem for him. But it'd be interesting. Who's the closest to Inter, I suppose? Well, maybe Man United in the way that, that game will set up in the final. But I think that's that's what you'd probably, as a manager, yeah. go in scratching a loop, back to the chess thing. What problem? How would I overcome it? And which game would prepare me better for it? But, mm. but the ultimate stand to the freshness of your players. Yeah. Um, do we think Manchester City are going to go on and, and win the treble? Yeah. 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 There's like, I, I, any, I, any doubts in anybody's mind I, at all? Even in the final. Yeah, I think final. Really? You, you think that'll be the harder of the two games? Yeah. It's like, at any point, do you think Man United will want to well, yeah. make them become like, treble uh, winners? Or... What Ten Hag said after the League Cup. Yeah. Or no, after they, after they qualified for the final, when he, uh, he was specifically asked, all the supporters care about stopping the treble. Yeah. We will give 100% so they can... <laughs> Yeah, so that, that message is received. I think it's the first time they played in the final as well, in the yeah. cup final together, which is which is crazy. Mm. I think of the history of both clubs. And, and again, and she have got that added thing. So if we're here next season talking about this, is like, oh, they missed out and Man United stopped them being the, the same mm. team as the treble team in 99. One of them got that extra motivation, Man United, haven't they? But yeah. I think if, I personally, I think if Man City play to their, to their, to their high standards towards the end of the season, they'll, they'll do both finals. It happened in 77, actually. Liverpool were going Did for the treble. And United beat Liverpool in the FA Cup final. Liverpool won the other I was team. only one then. I know, I know <laughs> it's too young for me. <laughs> um, we need to talk about Arsenal as well, just to kind of wrap up this, this sort of title chat, because they're the ones who have made Manchester City go and, and attempt to win their last 14 games of the season. They've done it with, the, with these previous 12 games. But Arsenal have allowed them back into this, this race. There were the, the three games that they drew back to back, having gone from eight points clear on the 7th of April, plus the two games against Manchester City that, that they've lost since the, the turn of the year. You, you, you can point to the dip and they just hadn't given themselves enough breathing space. They... The first month, I think it was March, they played every three every three days Arsenal, and it actually suited them. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it was less thinking time, play a game similar yeah. to City. Then the following month, I think they had more rest time. You know where they dropped the two they had two gold leads, and they dropped them. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. thinking that was at your detriment. 
you know, where they yeah, had the more recovery West Ham, time. Southampton. Yeah, they had and more recovery was, yeah. time to think about it. And I think it was at their detriment where, you know, where you're thinking, you go in the training ground, you're like, how did we, how did we drop that 2 0 lead? Mm. Oh, we're out of it. Oh, we've got another one coming. And then we play City. And I think it got a little yeah. bit too much there for them. But what I would say is if you flipped Arsenal's season, and they started off poorly and ended the season like a Liverpool have done. 50 points in the first half of would, the season. Would we be saying like now, oh, they're, they're like some of the com- I don't think we would. I think they're a young team with Arteta. Yeah. I think they've done really well personally. I, I do, I'd agree. It, it reminds me actually of Tottenham and them, and Arsenal fans won't like that. Hmm. But Tottenham under Pochettino in 2016, where they had that first really good season under them. Then we're kind of in a title race without realising, which is supposed different to Arsenal. Lost it to Leicester and then just collapsed a bit. They got hammered at Newcastle. Uh, they were beaten in another game. Actually, and Arsenal finished ahead of them. But then the next season, they came back and got 86 points. Um, and I'm not saying the same will happen, but the potential's there. So any team that has had an eight-point lead and and not won the title has won it again mm. the next season in the in the Premier League. I just wonder. I think teams are being asked to do different things mm. now to win the title because of Manchester yeah. City. I wonder, from your perspective, if you think that we could see a hangover. For, for Arsenal at the start of, of next season, kind of similar to what we've seen from Liverpool this time around, from the, the really intense season that they had had last time around. Yeah, but, but I think Liverpool played like 60-odd plus games. Arsenal haven't haven't done that yet, really, I don't think. Uh, but, I mean, even even this, the psychological effect of it, because there isn't, a, like you said at, at times, yeah. not, not, the we're not going to, when, you know, when, we're not like... Going to be talking about Arsenal bottling it, but definitely the Go it on, looks as though the emotion. Just say it, Kelly. Yeah, but it, but Ray, Ray's not here today. You got no, me. You can say it if you want. Because it's not what I'm, <laughs> what I'm trying to talk about. It's like genuine emotional toll yeah. and exhaustion. Yeah. Depends that who they the bring in. Hit a wall if they, they yeah. get a good recruitment phase in. Yeah. That will be the you know they've got this far. The bottom line is they need players to get them to the next level. So who is that and what does that look like? I think Arteta said as well, you've got to go through the pain of this season. A bit like Man City players in the semi-final last year, they lost to Real Madrid. And they, they used that pain this year against Real Madrid. Yeah. We're going to show them we are this team. Arteta's got to use it for this. He calls it a journey they're going through. Yeah. A painful journey because they've lost out. But at the same time, as Karen says, if they recruit right in the summer... It could be the making of them maybe next season. But, but again, they've got, to, they've got to top of Man City, of course. It, it used to be the old truth of football. They have to go through it once before you actually win it. And yeah. like happened to United in 92, happened to Liverpool in 2019. So, I mean, maybe similar can happen there. Yeah. Do you think it will? I, I think Arsenal will improve, I have to say. I think, they'll, I think they want about four players in the summer, mm. including Declan Rice, as we all know about. Um, and I, I do think they'll pick up. But I suppose, yeah. They'll have the, they need the break of a summer maybe to, yeah. to cleanse themselves a bit of what, what's just happened. They had heartbreak last year, though. In terms of Champions League. Champions League. Yeah. Yeah. Looked, so. And they used it to, to yeah, fuel yeah, yeah, the, exactly, the improvement yeah. this time around. Mm. And, yeah, maybe a couple of players over the summer and Arsenal fans can start to feel yeah. a little more... I like dream to, again. I'd just like to go to the break leaving everybody happy. That's all <laughs> it is. Right, and right. And, yes, exactly. We'll have to send a little clip to Wrighty to keep him smiling <laughs> until he joins us again next week. Up next, though, it's going to be a bit more difficult uh, to try and put smiles on people's faces because we're going to be talking about relegation. There's a huge game tonight for Leicester when they take on Champions League chasing Newcastle United. tight at the bottom, as it has been all season. But we already knew that Bournemouth were safe. Uh, we knew that West Ham were safe. They just made sure of it with that win against Leeds yesterday. We know that Nottingham Forest are safe after their win against Arsenal. Incredible scenes at the city ground for that one. Everton could still be caught by Leicester, even if Leicester lose against Newcastle this evening, because there's three points between them. And Leicester do at the moment have a better goal difference. Leeds United inside the bottom three then. They need to catch Everton as well and Southampton 
already relegated. There is so much still to play for. And that is a huge game coming up for Leicester against Newcastle United. Nottingham Forest have had their big game. They've beaten Arsenal. It was extraordinary to see at the City ground. And, and interesting to note that they're one of the teams at the bottom. One of the two, including West Ham, didn't change their their manager. And that was really due to the fact that there was there was pressure from the Nottingham Forest supporters to keep Steve Cooper on. Yeah, it does feel like that's a story from the bottom of the table. It's almost like the timing of when people made appointments or whether they decided at all. I mean, as you said, Moyes is another. So many interim appointments. Palace are the outlier there because they brought Roy yeah, Hodgson yeah. in. and they. But, but, but you, it, all, it also feels they did it at just the right time. And it feels like that, again, it's, it's the decision with your manager that has basically decided this whole bottom half, the whole re relegation battle. Yeah, that, that achievement from, from Nottingham Forest at a yeah. time when there's been a couple of times this season where it looked as though they might not even get another win for the, the mm. rest of the season. It, it certainly felt like that. They went, I think it was 11 games without a win at one stage. Mm. I think as well, and, and going back to Chelsea a little bit, we've, we've rightly criticised the amount of players they've brought in. Not, Nottingham Forest equally brought in loads and yeah. loads of players and for him to do what he's done mm. to kind of galvanise him to get the best out of him to fix his team and to get the results and also to manage the expectation and, and the pressure that was under but credit to the chairman no we're sticking with him we're backing him and then everyone getting behind him um, but you know to manage that player kind of all the players coming in and we were all like whoa it was just so well, some many some of them he had to but then well, yeah, there were like 29 yeah, players but, who came in over the summer and then Chelsea. they added again in January but they're the players who actually seem to have come good at this stage it's the difference between buying players because you just need to to fill mm -hmm. seats and actually getting a couple of months under your belt and saying right this is what we need now between now and the end of the season yeah I think you got to give the owner of credit as well because he's stuck with them um, I mean Forrest not been in the Premier League for so long and, and although in his interview after the no, game on Saturday, not, he, wasn't that he, didn't, he didn't sound like he was fully was, behind Steve <laughs> Cooper at those stages of the said, season. What's the options out yeah, there or something? Yeah, yeah. But to be fair, he could have done because he, 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 yeah. could have, he could have sacked them. But you have to remember where, when he took over, Steve, but they were in a relegation yeah. fight in the Championship. And you take them all the way up through the Championship, mm. promotion, of course, and then, you know, to be safe of, of a game left as well. I mean, it's just, it's, it's probably manager of the year. I mean, he's, he, oh. you nearly think he's in the conversation, him and Gary O'Neill at the yeah. bottom. The yeah. jobs that they have done. I was about to say that anyone who wasn't sacked is basically manager of the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's all you mentioned yeah. Roy Hodgson, obviously, is, is, is probably the one that, that sticks out. Yeah. He's done so well getting mm. to Palace. But but the other managers, it's not worked out. I mean, look at Leeds. Leeds yeah. are in banging trouble. Everton are banging trouble. Mm. You know, the, Leicester sacked their manager. They're banging trouble. Yeah. So it's, it's, it doesn't always work, does it? The, the one thing about that, and like with the three teams we have left, it does feel like almost all three coaches are trying to work two squads that have been built for another model of football. I mean, like Leeds, obviously, I mean, that's basically a Bielsa and then um, uh, oh, Marsh squad, yeah, that, that kind of Allardyce now trying to impose his game on. Everton, right, a bit more of a half house, but still Dyche trying to do something quite traditional. But then Everton have been a yeah, mixture yeah. of lots of different managers, yeah, players, true, yeah. and, and so what we're trying to get is, is Sean Dyche making it more direct and more effective. Yeah. The, the injury to Dominic Calvert-Lewin might might yet be a, a bit of an issue for them as yeah. they head in towards, because he, he wasn't, uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't look great that, mm. at that stage so that could be something that affects them let's take a look at the the fixtures that these teams have got between now and the end of the season it's only a tiny little graphic now <laughs> uh, Leicester have got Newcastle at St James's Park tonight actually Leicester can lose that and still stay up and you would think that that Newcastle side who only need one point from the remaining two games to qualify for the the Champions League should be on great form in their last home game of the season. Mm. It's going to be an incredible atmosphere at St James's Park. And you just wonder how Leicester are going to be able to do that, given how flat that they've looked. But then Everton have got Bournemouth, which is kind of unpredictable because they have yeah. been good under Gary O'Neill, but they've also looked quite end of the season-y. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you've got Tottenham, again, a bit unpredictable against a lead side who look a bit flat as well. And then Leicester take on West Ham, who we saw beat Leeds, yeah. but... I mean, again, it didn't look like the, you know, they've got a, a European final mm. on their yeah. minds as well. So they're all a bit tricky to, to try it, and predict. And on that as well, I'd be curious to the guys like, from, from playing these occasions, but whenever we go into these games thinking about it, the actual, the day itself, because there's so much tension and edge, mm. that can just change. I mean, say, like, uh, everything you'd think are in the best position, but you say well, Bournemouth can produce, and say if word comes true that Leeds are up, then that suddenly yeah, no. changes the whole... I mean, like, did you guys ever feel... That sort of thing, and on, well, the mindset of the yeah, players, on the final, it, yeah, because you're, you're right. What you're saying in the in the stadium, the atmosphere changes like that. Mm. 
And you can see the players visually looking around going, they must have scored, they've scored. Yeah. And, it's and so then you get the false ones now because bit. of social media. Yeah, you get all ones. the little ripples that go yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's not straightforward, is it? I mean, it's, it's just so hard to call. You mentioned, obviously, my old club, Newcastle. Mm. Well, they've, they've got their own Champions League place to go. They've not been in the Champions League for 20 years yeah. now. So if you're Leicester fighting, scrapping for points at the bottom of the league, the last place you want to go on a nighttime game is St James's <laughs> Park. Mm. They have to only get one point, and I'm sure Eddie Howe will set up the team tonight to go... Just go all in. We're going to go and win the game. So it's definitely going to come down to the wire for them teams right at the bottom. Yeah, and, and that's when it... I mean, it, it is going to be those three teams yeah. on the last day of the season that we're looking at and thinking, can they do it? Mm. Yeah, and I think, Shay, you're right. I think Newcastle will cement it later. I just think it'll be too much to stop them, especially at home, as you said. But the the one you mentioned about Bournemouth mm. as well is Bournemouth have got nothing really to yeah. play for now. It depends what mood they're in, whether they've had a bit of celebratory time, whether the shackles are off and they're relaxing and they play more free-flowing mm. football. Like, just flick a coin, you don't know who you're going to be playing up against. And you're right, how do you manage your own anxieties if you're in that position of being in the bottom? So um, it's, it's, it's brilliant for us as neutrals, horrible if you're the fans being in that situation. Um, but you, you just can't call it, really. Yeah, and re regardless of what happens tonight in terms of the bottom of the table, it's not really going to change too much what's what's needed on the on the final yeah. day. It's still, those three games involving those three teams are going to be are going to be crucial. And the other side as well, actually, just the three clubs involved all have this kind of immense Premier League history. Leicester, one of the great stories, haven't won it. Mm -hmm. Everton, one of the most successful clubs in, in England that have also had a few great escapes over the time. Leeds, one of the best supported clubs, the last champions before the Premier League. There's like We're talking about three kind of massive names who the cost of going out with the league, whatever about kind of financial rent like that, more so the prestige for the clubs, it kind of adds the element to it. They're not, they're not clubs that usually, sure, at least they shouldn't usually be Can, in this sort of situation. I mean, I know you're saying flip a coin. Can any of you call it, do you think? I think the three there at the minute, I think, I think that's... You think Everton will just have enough to... Just sneak it. I think I fancy them, obviously, in the driving seat. It's in their own hands, and that's that's a good thing coming last game of the season. It's in our hands. They won at Goodison Park, then it doesn't matter what noise is going around the stadium. Mm. If other teams have scored, it, it's in their own hands. So I think Sean Dice, again, will have just have enough to, to keep them up. If we assume, and I think it's a relatively fair assumption, that Newcastle win at St James's so, Park, yeah, they, so. they, they, they only need a point from the last That's two. Right. Either way, either way, they'll be in the Champions League next season. But if we assume that that's going to happen, what do you think? Last day of the season, can you call it? What to who's going to go down? Yeah, I think I'm with Shay. I think yeah. Everton will stay up. I do. Yeah, I think I think I fancy them against Bournemouth. I think Bournemouth will be kind of switched off. Yeah. Not in, that's not to annoy Bournemouth fans, but I think. They're done. Their task was to stay up, and they've done it. And I think, go on, Everton. It's over to you, really. It's in your hands. What do you think? H hard to say, but I, mean, I suppose... Or not hard to say. I mean, I actually, I'd be inclined to agree to guys, but just because, maybe to offer something different. Given it's Spurs and the form they're in, I do wonder whether Leeds go at them, score early, and that suddenly changes the atmosphere the whole day. Yeah. So that, that, is my, that is the one... Like so Leeds could get an early goal, like they did against West yeah, Ham. Yeah, exactly. Get an early goal and suddenly at they, home. Yeah. They, it starts to play into the nerves of yeah, some of the yeah. other ones. I, li I like yeah. a sense of jeopardy <laughs> on the final day of the season, but who knows uh, what's going to happen. We'll be reflecting it all next week. But there's so much live football coming up for you. So it's a busy week this week. Monday night, as we said, Newcastle United at home to Leicester City. Newcastle just need one point from their remaining two games. Leicester, of course, I mean, a win would be ideal. But even if they lose, they can still stay up with the right results on the final day of the season. But it won't be in their hands. Uh, Wednesday, it's Brighton against Manchester City. Because of goal difference, Brighton are pretty, pretty much guaranteed sixth place. But they can make sure of it if they get anything against Manchester City on Wednesday night. But this is a City side, of course, who are looking to keep in that um, momentum with the FA Cup final, Champions League final coming up for them. Thursday, Manchester United only needed a point as well to make sure that they're sure of Champions League football next season. They're at home to Chelsea and who knows what's going to be happening with them over the summer and into next season. And then on Sunday, Arsenal looking to end the season on a high. They're up against Wolves. It's Aston Villa against Brighton. And big game for Villa, that one, because they're chasing European football. Brentford at home to Manchester City. Chelsea against Newcastle. Crystal Palace against Nottingham Forest. Everton, as we said, at home to Bournemouth. Leeds United at home to Tottenham. Leicester at home to West Ham. They've all got home games as well. Manchester United at home to Fulham. And Southampton welcome Liverpool to St Mary's.
At the end of that, we will know everything that has been decided for this season. And we'll be reflecting it all on Monday next week when we look back at what's been an extraordinary season again of Premier League football. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.